I know, I know. It's been longer than you likely wanted to wait to hear more. I've been in a place the last few days that I've been calling the DGB Zero. It's a place I've never been before, but it seems to be where Gale has been staying. There isn't any real difference between the DG Zero and any other store, but Gale has been living there for, well, for a long time, and says it's his kind of base of operation. What's more, Gale can bring things between stores. When I asked him how, he said it was a trick that he had learned and that he might teach me if he had time. I laughed. Time was something we seemed to have a lot of. I honestly couldn't tell you how long it's been or how long I've been here. It never gets light out. There are no clocks inside the store. My phone time changes, but sometimes the date and year jump ahead by years or back by centuries. Right now, what says it's... 3278 on Fronde in Mimtober in 1632. I haven't received any replies to any of my messages or posts, but I honestly haven't checked much. I don't even know if you guys are getting these anymore. I haven't seen a reply since the first installment, so I haven't really been responding. So don't take it personal if you've been sending me messages and I haven't been getting back with you. I've certainly been a little busy after all. But, on to what you're dying to know. Gale's a middle-aged guy, probably about 40 or 45. He's still wearing his Dollar General uniform, complete with name badge. He says that no matter what happens, it always comes back. The only thing that seems to stay with him are the bags under his eyes, and the guy looks tired. He made us dinner, soup and sandwiches, and toasted me with a pop from a brand I wasn't familiar with, but it turned out to be ginger ale. After eating a couple of bowls of stew and about three sandwiches, I hadn't eaten much of substance in a few days, we started talking. I told him about my life as a wage slave, and he commiserated. I know what that's like. I had actually been transferred to this store when I got stuck here. How long ago was that, I asked, sitting back in the wicker chair that he had brought from somewhere else and listening to the comfortable creak. Who knows, Gail said. When I left the world as I knew it, it was 1998, and I'd just been sent to South Dakota to manage a new store. It's more pay, and you can pick your own crew, my boss had said, and I was glad for the money. My ex-wife had just petitioned for more child support, the third time in as many years, and I was just trying to keep myself fed and in a bed in my head above water, he said with a laugh as he took a sip from the green can that it called itself Seo Firm. So, I left Scottsdale, where I'd been managing one of the few remaining J.L. Turner and Sons, and after looking through some applications, I decided that I liked the look of Kenneth, Celine, and Margot. Oh yeah, wait, I remember, there was another name on that memorial. When did Rudy come along? Gail looked away then, and I tried not to notice as he teared up a little. Oh, how could I forgot Rudy? I'd been working at the store for a few months when he called me, Rudy was a lot older than his sister, from my first marriage when I was barely more than a kid myself, and he had been managing his own store in Texas. The store, however, had been burned down suddenly one night, and he was wondering if my store had any positions. I know you're the manager, Dad, but I'll do stock work if I need to. The noise around here makes me think that the locals don't like me being here any more than they liked the store, and my apartment might go up in smoke next if I stay. Dollar General had run a few of the mom-and-pop stores in town out of business, you see, and the locals blamed Rudy and the DG for it. So, I called corporate and asked if I could get funding for one more worker, and Rudy came in to make it five. We were tight-knit, working long hours and trying to compete with the local markets. The mom-and-pops in Chamberlain were dead set against losing business to us, but we held our ground and carved out a niche for ourselves. We didn't run the town, but we did okay. Then, one night, we got robbed. Margot and I were manning the front, Kenneth was in the back, and Celine was staying over to look at the books. She'd been an accountant before taking a job that was a little more flexible, and I had promised her some overtime if she could help me balance the receipts before our yearly audit next week. I wasn't even supposed to be there, but I was helping Margot through a busy time before the guy came in. 
We were getting ready to clean up after closing so we could pass the audit, and Rudy was coming in around 8 to help. We'd all clean for a while, and then maintain through Sunday, so we could be ready and fresh on Monday. We were just getting ready to close the doors at 8 when he barges in and pulls a gun. The guy... The guy had to be looking for drug money. He was out of his mind on something, and he rounded all of us up and put us behind the counter. He emptied the register, tried to get the safe, but it was on a timer that wouldn't even open till after 10, and made us empty our pockets and hand over our wallets. I was just thanking the universe that Rudy hadn't shown up when he popped up with a pizza after coming in through the employee back entrance. So, he joined the hostage situation. We all started out behind the counter, but the robber thought there might be a silent alarm back there. So he moved us all to the break room, but thought we might gang up on him in there. There was no door hanging on the break room, so there was no way to secure us. He finally decided to put us all in the bathroom and keep us pinned up there while he left. He herded us in through the door and imagine our surprise when we came out in a different Dollar General. It was just like ours, except the doors wouldn't open. We didn't think about trying our way back through the bathroom, and good thing, too. These Dollar Generals don't seem to look back on themselves. The bathroom only takes you to a different one, never back the way you came. But you go to different ones, I put in. He smiled. In time, my friend, in due time. You probably remember the first Dollar General you stayed in for a while. I imagine it got a little boring after a while, didn't it? I nodded, telling him it had only taken about a week for me to be done with it. Well, imagine that time times five. First, it was a lot of fun. We played games, we spent time together, and kind of felt like a real family. Rudy and Margot had been having a not-so-secret relationship for months, and Celine and Kenneth and I had been hanging out a lot after work. We cooked dinners, we made crafts, we built puzzles, and for a while it was great. After a couple of weeks, though, we all started to go a little cabin crazy. The sun never rose, the lights never went out, and the door never opened. We didn't know how we were being kept here, but some of them started trying to find a way out. He took another sip of his ginger ale, and as he wetted his throat for the long story, he pressed on. It started with Kenneth. Kenneth was an avid hiker and liked to explore. He wanted to see if the space outside the Dollar General was the same as ours, but he couldn't get the door open. He pushed and pulled and tried to break the glass, tried to wedge the door open, but it was no use. He tried for three days to get outside, and on the fourth day, something unexpected happened, something that showed the rest of us that we might not be as alone here as we'd thought. The door opened. Kenneth had been shoving at it for most of the day, trying to get the front doors open and failing miserably. He finally threw whatever he was using down like a child having a tantrum and kicked it half-heartedly with his foot. Then, to his astonishment, it opened as smoothly as it ever had. Outside was nothing but smooth darkness, like the waters of a deep lake by night. And when he took his first step, I told him not to. I felt like something out there was wrong, some place we weren't meant to go, but he was powerless to stop himself. He stepped out into the darkness, and as he passed between the doors, they slammed shut behind him. I've never seen them open again like that, and they never opened for him to come back in again either. I glanced at the door to the Dollar General he had chosen to take up residence in, and that was when I noticed something. Someone had piled things in front of the door. Card racks and newspaper racks and other things blocked it, and it was unlikely that it would open and tempt him again. Some of them weren't even in English. Some of them had odd dimensions to them, and it was clear that he had ranged wide to find some of these things. Then Margot got snatched by whatever lurks in the ceiling. I call it the miasma, the thing that came after you in the burnt-out store. Had you seen it before? Once, I said. Bet it was right after you started messing with the ceiling, wasn't it? I nodded guiltily. Rudy and Margot had been looking for a way out as well. They decided they could get out through the roof, but 
when they took some of the tiles down, they discovered a deep bank of darkness up there. It was just like the stuff outside the door, and when Rudy reached out to touch it, I told him not to. Rudy was a good kid, and he knew better to touch something that I was worried about. The two of them were young enough, though, that when they called me over to see something, I watched as they tossed a tennis ball into the void. They had about four empty cans of tennis balls on the floor, and when I asked if they had all gone in, Rudy said they had. When I asked how many had come out, he told me none. I didn't think anything of it, and when he threw the cans up there, none of them came down either. I was settling in, getting ready for bed, Celine already snoozing on the little sectional piece we had pulled in close together when the lights went out. This was alarming because the lights had never gone out before. The lights stayed on all the time, which was why it was hard to tell what time of the day it was and how long you had actually been here. There was a weird growling noise, and I heard someone scream from out in the darkness. Something fell over then, and I grabbed Celine as the two of us buried ourselves under piles of blankets. I was worried for Rudy and Margot, but at that point in time, I was more concerned with surviving until the lights came back on. Something stomped close to us, making a lot of racket as it pushed things around, but after a while, the lights came on again, and we surfaced to find some shelves shoved over, and a lot of things crushed and smashed. Rudy found us not long after that, saying that he and Margot had seen a monster come out of the ceiling. It had grabbed her as the two of them had run for the manager's office, and when the lights came back on, he had found the same mess that we had. When I asked him what it looked like, he said it was hard to tell with the lights off. He drew the picture you saw in the break room, and for a while, that was the best description we had of the miasma. Rudy was sullen for a few days, looking at the hole in the ceiling, but I told him to leave it be. It had clearly come out because we had messed with it, and if we left it alone, it would leave us alone. He wanted to go for Margot, said he thought if he went up there he might be able to find her, but I told him to forget about it. We lost two people already, and the thought of losing my son was, was difficult to think about. After, after three days, I woke up to find a letter saying he was going to find Margot, and a ladder set up directly under the ceiling. I climbed it, meaning to go in and get him back, but after standing on that top rung and looking into the murk for nearly an hour, I finally climbed back down and put the ladder away. It was just Celine and I after that. We sat in silence for a few minutes, lounging on the padded sectional pieces that I now questioned whether or not had been their sleeping arrangements. I'm tired, he said, his voice hollow as he lay back. Let's continue this after some shut-eye. He rolled away from me, facing the chocolate upholstery, but I doubted he slept. At some point I dozed off after trying to ignore his quiet sobbing, and woke up to find coffee, eggs, bacon, and toast. Figured you might want a nice hot breakfast after, after what we went through yesterday with that thing. Don't worry, it's all scavenged from stores like ours. None of that human meat or weird animal parts or anything. I hadn't thought of that, but it was certainly an interesting concept. As we ate, Gale finished his story. Celine went last, and she may not even be dead. I was distraught after Rudy, just sitting there and feeling sorry for myself, but Celine had been experimenting with the door that we had come through. She told me how she opened it to find another Dollar General beyond that, and when she threw things into it, they came back. I just sat, not taking any of it in, and then one day she came up to me and said she was leaving. I looked up to see that she was wearing a backpack and had put on a floppy garden hat. Going? I asked, not understanding. Going where? You can't go anywhere. We're, we're stuck here. The food's beginning to dwindle even with just the two of us eating. It, it won't last much longer, and I don't intend to starve here. If that doorway took us here, then, then it can take us out again, maybe. Come with me. Even if, 
Even if we go somewhere else, it's got to be better than here. There might be food, or maybe Rudy, or Margo, or anything. Maybe Kenneth's out there somewhere. I don't know. Either way, if we stay here, we're going to die. Come with me. We can start over somewhere else. I wanted to. I really did. But at that point, I was at my lowest. My family had abandoned me. My son had left me too, and now the last of my friends had deserted me. I turned away, saying nothing, and when she left, I just sat there. She never came back, at least not as far as I know, and I've never seen her in any of the other stores I've traveled to. I sat there for a long time, just stewing, but eventually I was down to canned goods and big jugs of water. When the water ran out, I, I drank from the fountain. When the canned goods ran out, however, I started looking at that door, too. There was food on the other side. I could see it. And without thinking about it, I just stepped through one day. It was brand new Dollar General, fully stocked with food and set up for Christmas, and that was how it all started. I never stayed long in any store after that. I just, I just kept moving, hoping I would find Celine or Rudy or anyone. I found a few people, but the ones I found were usually scared or half crazy, and I moved on quickly. One fella, an old guy in a half-destroyed store, stabbed me with pruning shears as I went through his place. He pulled up his shirt then, and I gasped as I saw the spot he pointed to midway up his belly. I didn't see anything, though. Not a scar, not a red mark, nothing. It looked as fresh as new skin, and he laughed when I looked surprised. Luckily for me, it was close enough to the door that I could make it through. And that's when I made my biggest discovery. I fell through the door, grabbed at the shears so I didn't push them in deeper, and found they were gone. So was the wound. You've probably noticed that no matter how ragged your clothes get, they always repair themselves when you pass through the door, right? Well, it's the same with your body. Burns, cuts, stabs, they all heal when you go through the door. I've had all manner of things wrong with me, but a new store always means a new me. We sat there for a few minutes, each of us digesting something different, it seemed. Did you... did you ever find Rudy or Margo or Kenneth? I finally asked, already guessing the answer. It was several minutes before he responded, and I wasn't sure that he would for a minute. Nah. They went beyond the Dollar General Beyond. The store protects us, insulates us to a certain degree, but if we go beyond... And we're lost. I've watched the store change over the years. New items added, new layouts and concepts, but I've stayed the same. I was 43 and 98, and I still look exactly the same as I did then. I haven't aged, and neither will you. The store traps us, keeps us like this, plays with us until it inevitably breaks us, and there's nothing we can do about it. He looked sad, but when he turned back, his smile had returned. But, he said, there are things we can do to make it harder for them to break us. Things I can show you. Gail promised to teach me what he knows, and I'm eager to learn. I've shared enough for now, though. Gail's asleep, and I can tell that the tapping of my phone keys is bothering him. I'll update you guys in a little bit. Till then... Don't get stuck in the Dollar General Beyond either, or we might have to come find you as well. Till next time. You're still here. I thought you might be. Thanks for joining me for tonight's story. If your insatiable appetite for horror knows no bounds, might I suggest one of our playlists, or one of our previous stories in the archive? There should be one appearing at the end of the story any minute now. And of course, if you're not subscribed, why not go ahead and hit that subscribe button? Maybe hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of the spooky things that we do here. If you prefer your horror a little more analog, you can always pick up one of my books. There's a link below to my latest, and it'll take you to all the great things that I've posted on Amazon. For my book lovers in the audience, I always suggest coming on down to Patreon so you can become part of my ghostly reader tier and get a book anytime I write one, which is 
usually about twice a year. Speaking of my patrons, let's go ahead and thank them, shall we? Thanks to Unicorn Hollow for being our spooky ghost contributor. Thanks to Janet and Lady Vengeance for being our spooky skeleton tier contributors. Thanks to Hi Stacy, Winter, Zeronin, Emily Coltsfoot, Stephanie Carrington, Marianne Schuler, Tyler Parker, and Jennifer Damron for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. If you think you might like to support the show in a more monetary fashion, come on down to Patreon. I have many tiers. I'm sure you'll find one that suits you best. I always recommend the Ghostly Reader tier, since you get a signed book anytime I write one on your doorstep. But I have many tiers, and again, I'm sure you'll find one to suit you. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.